In our discussion on the epinephrine signal transduction pathway, we mentioned that this pathway uses a special type of receptor we call the 7 transmembrane helix receptor, or simply the 7TM receptor. And because these receptors actually use G proteins, we also sometimes call them G coupled protein receptors. Now, it turns out that the epinephrine signaling pathway is not the only pathway inside our body that uses these G-coupled protein receptors, these 7TM receptors. Another important pathway that uses these 7TM receptors is the phosphonositide signal transduction pathway, or simply the phosphonositide cascade. Now, before we actually take a look at the details of this particular signal transduction pathway, what's an example of a G-coupled protein receptor inside our body that uses this pathway? Well, one common example is angiotensin II receptor. So this is a G-coupled protein receptor that actually uses this pathway to regulate the blood pressure inside the cardiovascular system of our body. So we have a primary messenger, a peptide hormone known as angiotensin that binds onto angiotensin II receptor and that initiates this phosphonositide signaling pathway. So now let's actually move on to this pathway. And let's begin by examining the structure of this G-coupled protein receptor before that primary messenger actually binds onto its site. So we have the membrane, we have the, ins we have the inside the cell, the outside of the cell. On the outside of the cell, we have this cavity that basically binds the primary messenger. On the opposing side, the intracellular side, we have a trimer structure that is bound onto that 7TM structure. And this trimer consists of three different types of domains. We have the gamma domain shown in blue, we have the beta domain shown in brown, and then we have this alpha Q domain, which is a G protein. And so that's why we call this the G alpha Q protein. Now before the binding takes place, we see that this G protein contains the GDP guanosine diphosphate bound to it. And what that means is the affinity of the G alpha Q protein for these two domains is very high. And so it will exist in this trimeric form and it would be bound to that seven transmembrane helix structure shown in green. But when the binding process takes place. So let's imagine this is the angiotensin II receptor. In that case, the primary messenger is angiotensin, the peptide hormone. When that peptide hormone binds onto this site here, that creates a conformational change in the structure of the green piece. And then that induces a change in this orange piece. And so when that conformational change in the G alpha Q protein takes place, that is essentially constricts this site where the GDP is found, it squeezes it, uh, it squeezes it out to so the GDP leaves, but at the same time it creates a pocket, a region that has a high affinity for GTP, guanosine triphosphate. And so a guanosine triphosphate found in the cytoplasmic side basically is swimming around and when it gets close to the cavity as a result of that electromagnetic attraction it will be pulled into this cavity and that will basically induce a change in the structure. And once the GTP binds the affinity of this structure here, so this G alpha Q protein decreases in affinity and does not want to bind to these two domains. And so it detaches from these two structures and also from this seven transmembrane region. And so these two structures, the dimer that consists of the beta and the gamma, essentially moves away and remains bound to that phospholipid bilayer membrane. And that's because one of these structures actually contains a covalently attached lipid that, that is attached into the membrane. And so the G beta gamma protein remains bound to this membrane. But this G alpha Q that now contains the GTP goes on and binds onto a special membrane bound enzyme known as phospholipase C and this is shown in green.
And when the G alpha Q protein binds onto the phospholipase C, it stimulates its activity. And what the phospholipase C does is it binds or it, um, it cleaves a specific <coughs> lipid that is found in the membrane known as PIP2, where PIP2 stands for phosphatidylinositol 45 biphosphate. So the first P means phospho, uh, phosphatidyl, the I means inositol, the P2 means we have two phosphates at the four and fifth position. So this is PIP2, and this is what PIP2 actually looks like. And when the G alpha Q protein activates the phospholipase C, as the PIP2 moves across this side, right, because the PIP2 can diffuse across the membrane as a result of this large hydrophobic region, as it moves across, the phospholipase C cleaves this structure into two molecules. So essentially breaks this bond here. And when this bond actually breaks, we see that there are two molecules formed. One molecule is this hydrophobic tail or two hydrophobic tails. And this means this will not be able to dissolve in a cytoplasm. And so this entire tail here, shown here, will remain dissolved in that hydrophobic uh, membrane, while the other component, this entire region here, because it will contain one, two, three phosphate groups, it will contain many negative charges, it will be polar and it will be able to dissolve in the cytoplasm. And so this component basically detaches and remains in the cytoplasm and the other component remains dissolved in that membrane. Now, the part that is dissolved in the membrane is known as DAG, which stands for diacylglycerol, while the IP stands for inositol 145 triphosphate, and it remains dissolved in that cytoplasm. Now, the IP3 and the DAG are actually two types of secondary messenger molecules. So, what phospholipase C does is it cleaves this molecule, the PIP2, that produces two different secondary messenger molecules. Now, let's discuss what the IP3 does. So when the IP3 is cleaved, it is readily able to dissolve in that aqueous cytoplasm. And what it does is it moves on to a special ligand gated calcium ion channel that is found on the membrane of the endoplasmic reticulum. So this is one calcium channel, a second calcium channel. And so these IP3 molecules, the nosotol 145 triphosphates, go on and bind onto a special location on these ligand-gated calcium channels. And when they bind, they cause a conformational change that opens up that internal passageway. And now what happens is because we have a high calcium concentration in the ER lumen and a low concentration in the cytoplasm, it causes these calcium ions to move down their electrochemical gradient from the lumen into the cytoplasm. And these calcium ions do two different things. Number one, the calcium ions find a ubiquitous protein molecule we call calmodulin, and we'll discuss the specifics of what calmodulin does and what it looks like in a future lecture. But basically, the calmodulin looks like this, it looks like a hand, and it has a side, a pocket that binds that calcium. And once it binds the calcium, it forms the calcium calmodulin complex, and this complex can go on and stimulate the activity of different types of protein kinases. And remember, protein kinases phosphorylate and activate target enzymes and proteins. Now, the other thing that the calcium ions can do is they can go on and bind onto a specific type of kinase found on a membrane of, on the intracellular side of the cell membrane known as protein kinase C. When the calcium binds onto protein kinase C, it basically creates a pocket that allows the DAG, so remember, when the phospholipase binds, or when the phospholipase cleaves the PIP2, we not only form the IP3 secondary messenger, we also form the DAG secondary messenger. 
and now that calcium is bound to the protein kinase C that allows the DAG to go on and bind to protein kinase C. And once this takes place, it activates protein kinase C. And protein kinase C is a specific type of kinase, which means it phosphorylates target enzymes and protein. So protein kinase C, for instance, can initiate things like smooth muscle contraction. It can also initiate the breakdown of glycogen into glucose molecules and many, many different types of processes. So ultimately, this structure as well as this structure go on to basically initiate many different types of cell processes that ultimately create that physiological effect. And in the instance, in the case of angiotensin 2 receptor, that final physiological effect is the increase or the decrease in the blood pressure in the cardiovascular system. So this is what the phosphonotatide signaling pathway actually does. So once again, let's quickly review uh, this pathway. So the first step is the binding of the primary messenger to the active, uh, the active site, uh, not the active site, uh, the location on that protein. And when that takes place, it initiates the removal of the GDP from this G protein and this GTP replaces it. And once that takes place, this structure is basically dissociated. It goes on and binds onto the phospholipase C, which stimulates this enzyme to cleave the PIP2. And once the PIP2 is cleaved into two structures, the DAG and the IP3, these are the secondary messenger molecules. IP3 goes on and binds onto this calcium channel, opens the calcium channel up and allows the movement of these calcium calcium ions from the lumen of the ER into the cytoplasm. Then the calcium can either go on and bind to calmodulin, which forms a complex that can initiate many different types of processes, or it goes on and binds to protein kinase C. And in this case, with the help of DAG, it initiates protein kinase C, which goes on and basically carries out different types of cell processes and activates other enzymes that initiate cellular processes. Now, one last thing I want to mention is the following. What actually allows the cell to establish an electrochemical gradient in which we have many calcium ions in the ER lumen and very few calcium ions in the cytoplasm? Well, it's the activity of a protein, a membrane pump we call calcium ATPase, which we actually spoke about in the previous lecture. So it's the activity of the calcium ATPase pump that uses ATP molecules to generate this electrochemical chemical gradient that allows these ion channels to actually take these calcium ions and move them down their electrochemical gradient into the cytoplasm of that ER.